Well, I'm glad we get the chance to look at this passage from James. Uh, it's a very practical letter that some call it the uh, Proverbs of the New Testament. Uh, it seems to, to me James is very focused on making sure we don't have dead faith, right? Um, faith without works is dead. Faith is meant to be lived out, bearing fruit that reflects Christ, that honors him. So James lays that out in very, very practical ways. But before we dive into our passage, we have to go back a few verses to understand the context better, as we often do. Just as the letters of Peter, this is also a letter addressing the whole church at, uh, at the time. Sometimes it, it looks a lot like a Proverbs with one practical piece of kind of advice after another. Uh, but if you look carefully, you'll find some very good theological truths in between, which is important and which we can kind of lock our hands on and not just be people of works. In verses uh, 15 to, to 13 through 15 in James 1, we see him laying a foundation for us. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. He starts by making a clear distinction between trials and temptations. And as Christians, we're going to face trials. We all face trials. It's just like we talked about last week. Right before this passage even, James is talking about our faith being refined through trials and hardships. But now in verse 13, he starts to talk about something else, and that is temptation. Temptation is not the same as a trial. Hardships and trials come as part of life, living in a world that's broken, as we've, we've talked about many times, and even last week as we talked about our little whiles. God didn't desire for us to suffer, but he knows we will in this broken world, and just as like Jesus did when he came into this world as a man. And, as, and precisely because he overcame it, he told us to take heart and to trust him because he's going to be with us now. He's helping us do the same to overcome these, these uh, trials. So even when the trial itself doesn't go away, God carries us through the trial. That's what we've been talking about uh, many times. But today is different. Today we talk about temptation. God has no time for temptation, and he doesn't want us to entertain temptation either. We seem to think of temptation as sometimes as part of our flesh, just our brokenness, and therefore something we can't avoid. Some people <coughs> approach it even in a, in a fatalistic way, like, uh, or, you know, we may say to ourselves, or you heard someone say, oh, I'm only human, uh, you know, come on, just give me a break, I'm only human, as if there is nothing to be done about this issue of temptation. James makes it clear that God doesn't tempt anyone. We can go even one step further and remember that Matthew 4, when Jesus is tempted by the devil in the, in the desert, Jesus doesn't just resist it, he obliviates it. He, he just crushes it. He puts the temptation to death with the words of God and the word of life. We will come back to this, but now I want you to see the truth that James gives to us in these next verses, and he, he just said, God cannot be tempted with evil. He tempts no one. But then he says, but each person, when tempted, is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it conceives, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. I want you to pay very close attention to these verses because they are very, very important to understand the main past part of our passage. You can read these verses quickly and think he's just given us sort of the matter of fact, inevitable thing that we all just sort of trip into because we're, we're human. And that's what we're kind of conditioned to think about. It's not exactly what he's saying here. If, you're, if you read carefully, you'll see that he uses the when, when three times. And it's a progression. It's a progression of action here. It's not something we stumble into, but a series of choices that we progress in. And in Greek, we actually don't have 
the when in these verses, we have verb tenses that also express how each step is conditional to the one prior to that. It's fascinating because he continues with, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So again, listen carefully about temptation. It comes from the evil one. And through a certain desires contrary to God, we become vulnerable to them. But still, it requires a response from us. It requires us to respond. And the way we respond to temptation determines the outcome. I'll say that again because it's very important. The way we respond to temptation determines the outcome. It's not, ineb- it's not inevitable that we would fall. If you, if you question that, go back to read the scriptures again and look at Adam and Eve's response. How they sort of were tantalized by it. They kind of engaged with the enemy. Whereas Jesus had no part putting out the word of God and forcibly going into resistance mode. So we look at these verses and, and, said of all, and say of all this to come to this part, the greatest gift that God has given us. It's the most beautiful truth in this whole passage. In verse 18, it says, Of his own will, he brought us forth by the, truth, by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The, ways, the reason we can respond to temptation the way that Jesus did is not because we're great people or we have this ironclad will that we're going to resist. It's because we are born of him. It's because in his resurrection, we're brought forth in him. Christ is in us because of the resurrection, and we are birthed forth Christ because of that same event. So from the beginning, we weren't, we weren't intended to find strength in our own flesh. We're supposed to walk with God. Adam and Eve turned away from God and engaged with temptation on their own. And many of us try to do the same ourselves. We're, le- we're kind of leaving ourselves out there to, for temptation when we try to do it on our own. But here James is teaching us some pretty important lessons. I'll review. First, temptation. You'll face them. And some people will question God's goodness because you're, I'm I'm sorry, trials. You'll face them. And you're going to, some people even question God's goodness because of the hardships that come into your life. But please, please don't do that. Know that he also suffered so that our suffering would just be for a little while especially in comparison to what he has prepared for us in eternity with him, starting today. So cling to him. He will carry you through that trial onto the other side. But the second thing, temptation, it's not from God. Jesus relied on the power of God, the power of his word to destroy temptation and live in freedom to do the will of God. And that same power is available to us because that same word is available to us. We can respond to temptation by abiding in him. It's not just that we quote Bible verses at it. It's not that, it's not so cut and dry. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And now the word became flesh and dwells in us. And when we abide in him, and he abides in us, that gives us the strength and the power to resist temptation. And that's how we live a life of freedom. We depend on him. He abides in us, and we in him. So we don't abuse his grace, like Romans 6. What shall we say? Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? God forbid. We sit with the Father in submission to him. We acknowledge that the Spirit is in us, and welcome, we welcome his guidance and we honor Christ in all we do. So let's be pretty clear about one thing. This life of freedom is not just a, about a set of behaviors that we consider moral or a certain piety that we think pleases God. This is about a posture of our hearts. We come to the table each week and we pray a prayer of repentance. And that's not supposed to just be some mantra some sort of revolving door that never gets us closer to God. 
as if we're stuck with a set of behaviors that we need to ask his forgiveness for every week. You, you see, in the, the word sin, as understood by most scholars, is missing the mark. And the word repentance re- implies turning and taking a different action. So a prayer of repent, repentance is not a mantra. It's, it's an active form of reorienting ourselves to be face-to-face with God. More intimate relationship with him. To be more and more aligned with his will his character, and his love. It's to, when we miss the mark, maybe just by a, a, a hair, we, we need to turn to him and face him and say, you are my father, you are the son, you are the Holy Spirit. That's how we grow in becoming more like, like Christ. We acknowledge our tendency as humans to miss the mark and we actively turn to him so we can reflect him better. So it's not... Oh, man, this week I got a lot to lay down on the line before God at this time of repentance. And I'm I'm good. I can step. It's actively just being in the presence of God. So before you go, I want to show you one last thing. Know this, my brothers, the scripture says, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. We need another sermon to expand on what the difference between the anger of man and the wrath of God and how they are very, very different. But I just want you to to catch this. Because we don't know God in his fullness yet, we don't tend to think of the kind of, we kind of put the anger that we have on him when we say wrath of God. The feeling that's familiar to us when something or someone aggravates us, that, that jolt of anger that we feel. The feeling, uh, remember that God is not human. Quite the contrary, he made himself human so that we can be like him. So next time you read the wrath of God, don't think of the way you feel when someone cuts you off in traffic. Talk to him and remember that he, that everything that God is meant to produce in you is righteousness. He doesn't just come at you with his anger. He loves you. He is for you. So as, you, as we leave, let's pray, have a greater understanding of how to endure trials with him how to destroy temptations in our life by abiding with him, not not being passive or engaging with it, but knowing that Christ conquered them all. You you stay in him, relying on his spirit to empower you to do the same. And I pray that we live out our faith as you receive with meekness the implanted word, then we can live our faith with actions that reflect Christ, the word in us. Amen.